We are thrilled to be joined today by Professor Brian Singleton. Brian is the Samuel Beckett's Professor of Drama and Theatre and the Academic Director of the Lear Academy at Trinity College Dublin. A former president of the International Federation for Theatre Research, Brian is author of over 100 books, chapters, articles and essays and an expert on interculturalism in theatre. He's here to speak to us about international influences in Irish design and the scholarship that supports this. Brian, how are you doing today? I'm good, Kelly. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. It's, um, it's been wonderful to have you. Well, it's my pleasure. So, Brian, in your work as an educator, you've brought international theatre practices to students in Trinity and the Lear. Why do you feel this is important? Well, I, I felt as it was important right from the period when I was a student, and that's many decades ago. Um, I studied, either, you couldn't study drama in um, Ireland at that time. I went to London to study drama and uh, and I, I was exposed to so many international experiences. I mean, I'm, this, you know, obviously London, London Theatre in particular, the National Theatre, the Royal Shakespeare Company, it was, you know, they were performing all the time. So that was like a level of quality that I thought was extraordinary. Um, but it was the international uh, companies that came in for festivals. Um, uh, those are the those are the companies that I remember most. Um, it was uh, the Rustavelli Theatre from the Soviet Republic of Georgia um, doing a production wow. of Richard III, which I'd never seen anything like it in my life. And I thought, and I also saw a Beijing Opera, a Peking Opera. Again, it blew me, blew me away. So, what was what I, was what, different about what was different about those productions? What what was it that you hadn't seen before? Well, it was it was. Um, well, I'll include the third one, as I am Munishkin's theatre, Théâtre du Soleil in Paris, um, that it was, the, you know, there was a certain, there's a, the language obviously was different, it was in translation, Shakespeare was in translation, but it, it um, the, they all had a freedom, a physical freedom, uh, the actors seemed to have that, and uh, also they uh, transplanted their uh, productions into um, various des designs that we that I had not I had not seen. I mean, I, you know, they put saxophonists on the stage in Georgia. Um, it was a blend of uh, kind of jazz and theatre, and uh, it was a mixing wow. of forms. And also uh, with Manushkin, there was a live live percussion um, with the percussionist um, responding to the actors, and the actors responded to the percussionist. And uh, and also those actors I saw in Paris were athletes. Um, they were athletes. They could do triple somersaults wow. and uh, jump. Well, it was do the high jump oh. and act as well. So I mean, I, I've seen all that when I came to Dublin thirty years. It's exactly thirty years ago when I came back to Ireland um, to work at Trinity. Um, that was part of the job spec was to uh, bring in international um, theatre into the education. So off I went. They, get, they gave me some money, not not a lot, but I went to India for a while and uh, worked with the Indian Cultural Indian Council for Cultural Relations. Um, they organised a tour, a lecture tour for me, and in response, they um, brought they brought me to theatre companies all over uh, in several places in India, and they performed for me. I, I had these personal one uh, performances for me. Wow. Uh, and then they gave me videotapes, um, so I, I took the videotapes back home. And this was the first time, you know, pre-internet, that students were able to see what was going on in other countries. And then that's uh, amazing. The and what, year, what what do you think is what was the benefit of those students seeing those performances? Do you think what what well, um, I think, for example the the Asian traditional theatres of Manushkin, what, what was the benefit of that for them? Well, you know, Manushkin based all her work on uh, actual study of No and Kabuki and Katakali and all those theatre forms in the East and then created a kind of fusion theatre. Um, and that, we, we, because we'd never seen it before, it was all very exciting. Now, politically today, you can't really do that. Um, but it was, for, for me, I, I studied Kabuki because of 
Manushkin. I studied no because of Manushkin. I went to I went to the source wow. and studied the source, and I trained as a no performer. I trained in two roles in Tokyo, and um, I can't do it. Now. What was that it's, like, uh, Brian? What What was yeah, that like was, as an experience? I, I worked well. It was a joint. It was a um, reciprocal arrangement. It was a theatre director, very well renowned for his productions of Beckett. He was the Japanese director of Samuel Beckett. And um, we had a relationship with him through a Chinese design teacher, Chisato Yoshimi, who, who worked in Trinity College for about 20 years. So a lot of what her influence very much influenced students. And uh, so we we, uh, we got a Japan Foundation Artists Fellowship, both of us being the director. And I went to Japan and the two of us studied with a no sensei, a no teacher. Well, one of the top no teachers, literally in his house. He had a no stage in his house. And we went there every morning for three or four hours and uh, trained in two roles. And the idea was to come back to Dublin and uh, he, the Japanese director, would direct um, three uh, short plays by Yukio Mishima, who was a 20th century novelist who actually wrote to modern no, no plays. So we did that and that was um, for the opening of the Samuel Beckett Theatre. That was the very first show in the Summer Beckett Theatre. Wow. So I produced that. That's I was a producer. Opening. That's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, there's there are people that you'll you'll know. Kira O'Callaghan was in it and uh, uh, Jason wow. O'Mara, who's now over in Hollywood. You know, these were the, yeah. these were the students of the day and uh, they were in the show. So it was uh, they learned new forms. They, they met different uh, directors and their uh, and their methods. And also the design was completely different. Um, they hadn't experienced anything like that before. So um, it was very minimalist. And, um, uh, you know, we, we were obsessed at the time in the early 90s with realism. And uh, and this took it took the world into a whole new level. And also uh, we were we were reading plays which were not um, formed in the Western model. You know, this it wasn't um, uh, you know, Aristotle hadn't, <laughs> it wasn't Aristotle influenced. Uh, uh, they were very much rituals, uh, ritual dramas. And uh, and so I, I got, to, I mean, if you look at Irish theatre, um, particularly at the work of Yeats, um, and I studied his plays, I've, I've been in the National Library and looked at everything he's written about no theatre. Um, and he's actually dr drawn the no stage. He really understood no theatre. And s about several of his plays are um, are no dramas um, in all but name. I and, didn't know um, that about Yeats. That's, mm -hmm. that's very interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so that's, so for me, it was not just a case of looking at Asian cultures and showing students what they did and how different they were to us. I was actually showing them uh, to see how they related to what we did and how in the past um, our predecessors and the theatrical predecessors actually understood um, these things as well. And of course, we've we've tend to, f to forget that, you know, um, because we've yeah. tended Irish theatre has always been um, uh, considered to be kind of kitchen sink or cottage drama. You know, it's uh, a telling this the family story and the, and, the, and for family read nation. It's about the nation, and yeah. uh, so the these uh, knows uh, the, the no dramas they um, uh, they kind of dispel that myth. They're they're completely uh, they're they're based literally on rituals and transformation. Yeah. And so I was teaching. So they in kind the, of shake shake that kitchen sink notion up a bit, do they? Yeah, I mean, they, there's always a character who comes in from uh, another worldly character. And I'm thinking here of Kathleen Houlihan. I don't know if you know the play, with this, uh, with the old woman who comes in, um, a strange old woman, who literally comes into this domestic drama um, where the sons are going off to fight uh, for free Irish freedom, the four green fields of Ireland. And in comes this, uh, and uh, the mother doesn't want them to go, but in comes this ethereal old woman and she lures, like in rat catcher, like lures them away. Um, and uh, so this is very similar to the no structure. Um, okay. Of someone from another world who comes in, dance uh, to dance out the trauma, the contemporary trauma, and also the trauma of the, of the past and for Yeats that was colonialism and uh, and then the play resolves when the when the young men go off to fight for the four green fields 
Um, so Wonderful. this is all Japanese. This is Japanese, yeah. but nobody talks yeah. about it in those contexts. So I, I, no, I, in the early in the nineties, I did those productions, but set it um, in kind of the no structured stage, where I gave the students the formula of no, um, and taught them the footsteps, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then, of course, they made it their own. Um, but it helped with understanding the structure. Yeah, so Brian, like from our chat there now, it's very mm -hmm. clear that you, you go away, you travel around the world for your line of work, you studied in the UK, but why is it important for you to bring back, you know, everything you've learned and, and live and work in Ireland? Well, uh, there's a pragmatic reason and then there's a personal reason. The pragmatic reason was I got a grant to do a PhD and the condition was, this is from uh, the education board of Northern Ireland, and the condition was that uh, I would come back and, and work at home. Now, right. I came, I'm from, I'm from Mama, so it didn't quite work. I'm 80 miles away from my home, <laughs> uh, but I came back to Trinity. So there was, a, there was always that condition, of course, you know, nobody ever expected that you would do that. Um, but for me, it's very, it was very important. Um, I, uh, I wasn't sure, like, I, I, you know, the, I grew up in the 70s and 80s, and there weren't the opportunities uh, to teach at university. There were very few opportunities. Um, and uh, in fact, there were none and uh, for, for a period of time in the 80s, because there was a huge recession in Britain. And um, yes. so in 89, um, suddenly all these jobs appeared. I I had got a postdoc a postdoctoral fellowship from the British Academy. So I was, that, that was to train me as a lecturer. So I took that to the University of Glasgow. And that's where I, talk, talk about design, that's where I encountered uh, live art. Um, uh, they, they had a festival of live art every year. And I saw the most amazing things. I took my first year students in Glasgow into the most experimental, uh, shows that that really blew their minds. And my the, the good thing was it wasn't me with knowledge uh, telling them about it. I was just like them. I was like a big kid, like them going in to see something. Yes, played with there's nothing like seeing it firsthand. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I think reading from books can only give you so much, but witnessing it is something that is very visceral and it, it tends to stay with the person. Mm -hmm. So I think that was, yeah, I think it's it's one so, of the best ways to learn. Is to go and I see. Did. Absolutely. And when I was in Glasgow, I took the students to everything that could possibly take them to. And uh, I, I had worked prior to that at the Citizens Theatre in Glasgow. Um, and um, and the sits at that time was extraordinary. Um, uh, with, they were renowned for revamping the classics and uh, doing something really, I mean, they had, their design was incredible. Uh, but it was live art, actually, that um, really brought me into new dimensions of what theatre meant. Uh, and so when I came to Trinity, um, they asked me to, well, te first of all, teach theory. There wasn't theory. So teach performance theory, but also to bring in an international dimension. And the course that they told me to teach was non-Western theatre. And that's, a, a, you know, many of my graduates and people you know, probably, um, yeah. they, that's what they were referred to. That's, that's how I was known. It was non-Western theatre. Now, it's a term you don't use anymore. Um, some people call it world yeah. theatre. Even that doesn't mean anything. Um, so now I teach, I don't teach it as a, as a separate item. Um, I blend it into um, everything else. Um, it's just okay. one aspect of, so, because the students now are on the internet, they can see all these things at the same time. Yes. They can see them yes. before I see them. Um, it's a so lot I'm more not... accessible now, isn't it? To see world theatre, um, thanks to, the, yes. as you say, the internet. It's, yeah. 30 years ago, I was the purveyor of knowledge. I was the conduit of the knowledge of Asian theatre to students, whereas now, I, I'm not that. Uh, technology has taken over that role. And so what I, I do is kind of mediate. I mediate their perceptions yes. um, and try and get them to see things in different ways. So it, it's a different way of teaching. Um, it's much more enjoyable, yes. actually. Yeah. Oh, oh, that's good. So. That's good. <laughs> Brian, as we engage with international designers more and become aware of the work of, say, Castellucci or the post-traumatic theatre, uh, do you think we're beginning to approach design differently? For me, it was essentially post-modern theatre or post-Brechtian theatre. Brecht already, um, you know, changed theatre 
to show us, and for political reasons, to show us um, the machinery of theatre and not get caught up in the illusion. So that had an impact on, um, on certainly on a lot of young companies in Ireland, um, like Theatre Club in particular, um, uh, Force Entertainment, who do a lot of their work in Berlin as well. Um, in English, I saw them in Berlin. I spent a year in Berlin, 2009-10, um, watching all of this work at the Hebel am Ufer, which is the How at the Schaubühne. Um, lots of microphones, so bare stages, and it was so. So this, the sonography of was actually the machinery of theatre. That was the sonography. Um, the characters introducing themselves. I'm an actor playing the role of. Um, and, uh, and I, you know, after a year of that, I came back to Dublin desperately wanting a good story. <laughs> just give me, just, <laughs> just give me a good story and characters and uh, let me just be swept away with it. Um, and, but, but it's actually, I love both, but I came back, you know, once I'd evened off the experience, I actually love both. Um, with Castellucci, uh, yeah, Romeo Castellucci came, I think, three times to Dublin uh, with his different productions. Right. Um, and uh, he's very much a designer, um, but a, you know, a philosopher, a very interesting political thinker. And uh, he, he has his own um, laboratory and uh, with most of his children involved in it. I think his daughter's now running the laboratory, um, which is essentially a big oh, wow. white barn. Um, and he gets all the kids to paint it in whatever, it's, it's to stimulate their imagination. But his shows are very, very philosophical in a very, very visual way. Um, yes. And, uh, you know, the, the, we had two of the shows in the Beckett Theatre and there was one in the O'Reilly Theatre Belvedere as well. And he is interested, he, like he's, he's cutting edge. There's one show, in the, the last one, Tragedia and Gonidia 4. He didn't, he didn't, um, it was a it was contemporary tragedy. And at the, the place, uh, or the performance started off with uh, a robot, static robot on stage, dressed as a kind of little Mitchell man. Um, and a live baby sitting all on its own on the stage. What? 200 people in, facing this. Oh, and nothing my hap God. Nothing happened. Absolutely nothing happened, except uh, Castellucci was controlling the robot. So if the baby moved, uh, the robot would move. Um, and sometimes the wow. baby would interact. And well, some babies interacted with it. It was a different baby each night. Um, okay. But, so, but but the sp some spectators couldn't handle it, and they they walked out. Um, because okay. They didn't understand the you know the the there was zero risk, um, because their parents were literally a few inches away. Um, did and, did the baby uh, would did the baby cry or give out at any stage for being well, on I, stage? I was and... I, I, I was part of the audition process actually because I was head of drama at the time and at the Beckett. And uh, Castellucci and I auditioned babies. We had <laughs> something like hilarious. But, but what, was what was the criteria? What was the criteria? Chilled out babies. Just I think, chilled out babies. Yeah. Out no, babies. no, no, yeah. no drama king or queens. Just no. people who were content. And most of the of the five, the, the six shows, the uh, was it seven. Um, there was only one who was a little bit anxious on the night. Uh, most of them, they were laughing and chuckling away. Uh, and even wow. one of them acknowledged the audience. They thought the audience was great when they when <laughs> we were lit up. And, That's uh, brilliant. And it, it literally, he was literally pushing the boundaries of uh, of acceptability, what the audiences can take. Um, because that, yeah. you know that scene was over, and then there was another scene of a a soldier, or sorry, a policeman, in a almost like childlike costume of something you'd buy in a fancy dress shop, with a rubber trunch, and it wouldn't hurt anyone. And he was almost play beating someone, um, and then had a, a whole canister of fake blood, and he beat, he would beat the prisoner a few times, and then spray the blood on the floor, and the prisoner was writhing around the blood. It was more like a, chore a choreographed dance, actually, and it really yes. wasn't. I mean, it was just violence, which was kind of dissected, so you it, you couldn't see it as violence. It was just yeah. Post -traumatic, was it very right? shocking? Was was it very shocking yeah, to the audience at the time? The, the what was shocking was Castellucci, who was in the control room. Every time uh, the actor um, beat the prisoner, and, and sometimes he didn't. It, you could hear that it was rubber and it wasn't hurting him. You could hear that. Uh, yes. But Castellucci pressed uh, 
uh, a sound cue, which was a loud, like, uh, and he put the uh, loudspeakers underneath the seating bank, um, and literally everything just reverberated. Oh, okay. And he pl and he kept doing it until somebody walked out. That's what okay. His so aim was that was. his aim? All right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. At what point? Wow. Do he was you... very, very experimental. Then he liked to to. Um, it, was... it seems like he liked the shock value. Did he? I, it was a commentary on um, what uh, on content on the internet. You know, people are okay. watch this all the real stuff quite a lot, and it's uncensored. Yeah. Whereas he was showing on stage completely fake. It's totally unrealistic violence. Mm -hmm. There wasn't actually any violence, and yet that's what people walked out of. And when yeah. it's not violence, it's, it's amazing though. Mm -hmm. When when you take away the screen, it's almost when you're watching violence on a screen, you almost feel like there's that extra layer between you and the violence. You you have that in a theatre, and that layer is taken away. It was Hitchcockian. It was like Hitchcock. Yes. Uh, uh, without yes. the Hitchcocks, without, without the soundtrack, the birds wouldn't be as scary. <laughs> really. Yes. <laughs> well, they might be. Um, but uh, and then one of the final scenes I remember, there was an old man with white hair and he was uh, clearly at the end of his days in a bed. And then just over this period of about four minutes, five minutes, He's slowly, he's sitting in a kind of lying in a bed with a head and a pillow with the covers up. Um, and then very slowly, he just sunk into the bed and the, um, the blankets and the pillows just all went flat and he disappeared into the bed. Wow. It was, a, it was, it was an illusion. Well, actually, no, it, it okay. was a, a sunken bed, like he sunk underneath the... Um, uh, you know, into, <laughs> into the, the mattress or was it under? No, there was no mattress. It was just literally uh, the, f the, the kind of the mat or the mattress was just lowered very gently yes. until there was a flat okay. line. And it was kind of, you know, uh, you've seen the flat lining of, uh, in a hospital, you know, when someone's heart stops, yes. you get the flat line yes. on the monitor. And this was a visual <laughs> flat line of the person just disappearing wow. into nothingness. And he was gone. Wow. Was, that was the end. It was the most extraordinary thing I've seen, one of the most extraordinary things I've seen. Wow. Well, obviously, all those images um, that mm -hmm. he presented have stayed with you. So he's a very effective designer then. Yes. I, well, I think it was the, all of them, all of the imagery had such an effect on everyone, and including me. The, the, it was the violence of the sound, not the, vi mm. not the visual violence. That was affecting and it made it just made me think more it made me think more about what i'm watching on tv and what yes. what is it that's making me feel that way what is it um and if, is it yeah is it the violence you know i'm you know you, there's a lot or of is it or as TV. you say or is it the sound is it the sound like the unease of hearing it, as you said wasn't it underneath people's seats it was coming from yeah yeah, yeah. Wow. Uh, absolutely. So it, literally, our whole bodies were shaking. So the sound was creating us, creating a movement in us. Um, it was like an earthquake. And there's wow. nothing as elemental as an earthquake. Uh, so no. it was pushing theatre to those boundaries. But he, he's got a very political consciousness. You know, he's, he's really yes. looking at the contemporary world. Uh, and forcing us to, uh, you know, forcing us to look at the world and hold a mirror up to the world, um, and you know, and also look at um, how we accept one thing but don't accept another, and how we're kind of, you know, we we glibly ignore some violence and uh, and yet are horrified by another form of violence, um, yeah. you know, and his view is we should be horrified at it all. Um, at it not. all yes yeah, yeah. Oh, interesting oh. being an island we don't have easy access to the work of complicity um or minushkin mm -hmm. um, and our references are i suppose they're usually irish and maybe sometimes uh british um but in the last 20 years thanks to companies like pan pan and the dublin theater festival there's been a greater intercultural exchange in design can you talk a little bit about that brian 
Yes, um, I mean, it, it actually goes back further than that. It goes back to the 80s. Um, there were many practitioners who went abroad uh, to study, um, to the Ecole Jacques Lecoq, um, and uh, latterly with Anne Bogart, for instance, in New York. Um, and uh, all of those people came back and started experimenting in, I'd say, the early 90s, uh, which is about the time that I was um, starting in Trinity in 1990. Pan Pan emerged in 90, I think it was 91 or 92. Um, and they were, you know, the graduates of ours who were, who really were experimental. Like, um, this, you know, really avant-garde uh, work. And they were, they took their work to Europe and this was something unusual. Um, most Irish work prior to that would go to the UK, to Anglophone world, uh, to, uh, to London, or uh, Glasgow, Birmingham, New York, Philadelphia, Washington, um, to the diaspora, whereas this company went to Poland and uh, Germany and places like that, which we that wasn't a traditional route for Irish theatre. And of course, they brought back the influences from all those places and, and it was very different types of theatre. That they brought back. Would that have Are been they... seen as would that have been seen as quite a risky thing to do? Um... At the time, yes. Um, but for me, uh, you know, we hosted the first couple of international symposia that Pan Pan did. Um, so people registered for the symposia, and there were workshops from visiting companies and performance and visiting companies, and a lot of dialogue. And um, and I remember, that, you know, that's I, I felt that's the sort of thing we should be doing, you know. As a young, I was a young lecturer, and uh, I, I thought I didn't see anything risky in this. There's no risk in this. This is um, yeah. we're in a place of education. These people are at the beginning of their career, and um, they're experimenting. And what is theatre apart from experimenting and creating something yes. new rather than recycle the yeah. old? And yeah. uh, so it was It was risky um, and it was experimental, but what they did was they attracted a new audience. There was an audience for that. Yes, um, and it's, it's, it the was audience, a, a risk that paid off very well for them. You, you know, if you look at companies like um, Rough Magic, who've been around since, well, they're, they're my generation, actually. I, if I had gone to Trinity College, I would have been in the company of Rough Magic people. Because exactly those years they were at Trinity, um, and they and their audiences are now they've grown up with them, and they're now. Yeah. When you go to a Rough Magic show, it's a much older audience, but it wasn't thirty years ago; it was much younger. Yeah. And uh, so each generation needs its, you know, it has a, a new theatre emerges. And um, I remember seeing before I went to London, so I was quite young. Um, I was a teenager, and, and I saw a really exciting new company. Um, called Druid. It was wonderful. Sure. I'd never seen anything like what they'd done, and uh, and I thought, wow, that's really impressive, and um, and that was um, really original what they were doing. It was so earthy and so gritty and um, yeah. and realistic, and it wasn't played for laughs. And it was just that, that was edgy. That was a risk. Yes. Um, everything yeah. new is a risk, and. Um, so Pan Pan, I think probably it was the first big international, um, first big risk of an international perspective, I think uh, they marked that. Now, but of course we had um, all the way through this, we had the Dublin Theatre Festival with various curators um, bringing in shows from all around the world. And so, you know, with the, our Beck of Theatre, we we've always been a, a host for at least one or two shows. Uh, and we've always, uh, the, we've always tried to, program the edgy stuff um yes. we've always tried to yeah. get the directors to program the edgy stuff that our students would be interested in um and yeah. uh, usually they do and also the, the other big thing that happened in the 90s was the, the dublin fringe festival um there was in the early 90s there was uh, there was nothing for my students to go to really it was, when rough magic came to project well, the dublin fringe festival really prides itself in pushing boundaries and being experimental absolutely. and it's just been absolutely such wonderful work wonderful mm -hmm. work um from across all platforms in the arts over the last and, few years and that emerged from a, a young company called bedrock with jimmy fay who's now director at the lyric in belfast and uh he did a lot um his uh, bedrock's early work was 
was all international, um, international plays that we would never get to see at the Gator or the Abbey. And uh, this was, I mean, with the scenes and, and designs um, that were experimental. And uh, the, there was a big push to move out of theatres and into non-theatre spaces. Uh, and once you go to a non-theatre space, then the old um, division between audience and spectator, or, sorry, audience and actor is broken down. So you, you can experiment more with um, form. And and uh, it's about the experience. I mean, theatre is about experience. How do you experience it? Um, and if, you know, some people like to experience it as part of an evening out with a meal and a glass of wine. And just Actually, on that note, mm. on that note of experiencing mm. theatre, we're obviously going to be experiencing it in a very different way at the moment. And um, the mm. International Federation for Theatre Research recently posted from uh, their postcards from lockdown, with academics all over the world reflecting on the changes that we're going through. Um, mm. How has theatre scholarship been affected during lockdown? It's to be honest, it's hard to know just yet. I think, um, like, I, you know, I was, I think we were all in a state of shock and a state of mourning because the subject that we were teaching, um, you know, because we're teaching the next generation, and yes. suddenly, where's that next generation going to go? Where's the present generation yes. going to go? And what is the new form that's got to, um, that's got to uh, come through and survive this? And uh, so I think a lot of people were in shock, but um, I was reading those postcards um, and I know most of the people who wrote them and, uh, you know, there's, they reflect differently what's going on nationally uh, rather than internationally. Yes. Although it, it did have an impact, like the Black Lives Matter uh, movement had an international impact all over the world, even though it was very much um, it was an American major phenomenon in America. It impacted yes. uh, the discourse here and all over the world. And then a few lesser known um, uh, subject that's going on at universities in India is the crackdown on um, any kind of critique of the government and uh, this huge problems uh, in some of the universities there. So they're dealing with their own battles at the same time as COVID is raging around um, raging around the world, you know. So yes. the politics, uh, in the absence of theatre, there's a greater focus on the political and the political yes. context of how we're consuming uh, what we're doing. I think, uh, you know, I, I do uh, Zoom with quite a number of people on Skype or whatever and uh, around the world, and I do get a sense of um, that something new will emerge, but we don't know, yet know what it is what and, it is uh, yes so we're all we could talk about is the conditions of existence what are what are our conditions you, of existence yeah do you feel that online performances uh, could affect change politically or otherwise i think well yeah technology always affects change because uh, you know technology uh, can create wider reach if you look at you know i grew up in a world without mobile technology or internet technology i grew up in a world where i used to, this question i asked my students last september i said they said they, when i give them a project to do and they said oh we'll create a facebook group I said, could you just leave your phones <laughs> down for a minute right how do you think students how do you think students did this project in 1990? Uh, how did they communicate? Try and think of yeah. ways of doing it without Facebook. And um, so, you know, once I hear Facebook mentioned- Did they struggle? I, did they struggle with hmm, that, Brian? They yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I, I talked about all the, the notice boards weren't for us giving information about classes. It was all this, we had a, we had a notice board where students just posted notes to each other on it because um, they had no other way of connecting, they had no phones. And, oh, wow. uh, and this was, that board was just a smorgasbord of um, inter-student uh, interaction. Um, I'm not saying we should go back to that, but I do get depressed when I hear about um, Facebook sponsoring this, that and the other, or sp Facebook mm -hmm. is giving an artist a thousand euro to create some, because what, what that does is turn artists into content creators. Yes. You know, and that really that angers me enormously. I it mean, can it can actually artists. stifle it can stifle creativity as well, that kind of 
um, sponsorship. Yeah, yeah it can well, because it has to um, often uh, it often has to fit within certain criteria when they do that. It certainly does, and uh, yeah. was, but uh, you know, on the other hand, I'm not knocking technology. Uh, on the other hand, I have had lots of experience with of as being a spectator using all the technology um, with actors in different places in the city. And I'm talking to them on mobile phones. Um, I can see them. I can track them on GPS in front of me on the screen. I know where they are. They can they can send images of what they where they are in the city. Um, I can give them directions. Um, there are so many ways that we can um, create interaction and dialogue between yes. performers and audiences uh, using all this yes. wonderful technology. Um, and it has so certainly think, helped during this pandemic as well hasn't it it really has helped us the problem is the, the problem was lockdown touch. because you know lockdown forced us into our bedrooms really um we communicated yes. in our bedrooms and that's you know it was i, I was looking at uh, all the dear ireland uh, videos at the abbey um yes. commissioned uh, and it was such relief when someone was walking on a beach and uh our yes. An actor was in the was shower. outside. Yeah. Or a clean, yeah. cleaning a window. I mean, it was just so such a wonderful release and relief um, that you can yeah. create theatre. You don't need four walls to create theatre. No. And, uh, no. It's, you know, we try to box ourselves in. And, uh, I, you know, I think possibly the theatre of the immediate future is thinking beyond the walls of theatre. Um, yes. Because the work of social distancing, it'll probably come down to one metre. It'll expand and contract according to how prevalent COVID is in any city. And um, so if, you know, I think the bigger theatres are going to have the bigger problems um, with yes. filling the seats. You know, they need that return in order to pay for the f big production. Um, yes. So possibly micro, a kind of smaller scale micro theatre, um, interactive micro theater is the way to go the other thing i watched was lock lock in i don't know if you saw harry the rookie uh lock, uh, lock um, events this no was live i didn't theater. I, I love harry the rookie but i didn't see that yeah, event. It's, it, it was performed once a week um and i think it's still on maybe no i think it's finished now um but they performed i think it was every thursday night um live um uh straight to camera and um in a tv great I think it was idea a in a studio and you literally it was a theater you, you paid your money to get the key to access the theater and uh, and then what i loved about it was a great performances but um and i knew the play inside out so there was nothing new i think actually there was something new the actors were different and they created different aspects of the characters but do you know what was wonderful was to see the labor of the actors you could you know, yes. you know 30 minutes into a monologue the actor was sweating to see yes. the actor sweating, whereas you know pre-recorded oh, theatre—it was up close you, and personal. Absolutely, and pre-recorded yeah. theatre, film, TV—all of that disappears because because it takes time. Everything is stretched out when you're recording, whereas live theatre, it's live labour, and the sweat, um, um, of, you know, the blood, sweat, and tears—it's live in front of you on the screen. I love that. It was great to see it. That's the first yes. time I'd seen it. Um, on theatre, I've, I've watched a lot of live streaming of shows. I, um, I, I wanted to see Fleabag. I hadn't seen it. The play, uh, oh, Phoebe, Phoebe Waller-Bridge. Phoebe Waller-Bridge, um, yeah, amazing. Yeah, and she, she, it was really wonderful to see it. Um, yeah, but it, it was it was almost too perfect for me, just from a, a visual you know, perspective. It's funny, I you know, I've been I'm I'm actually also looking forward to watching my husband and I are, are going to sit down and watch Hamilton as well. That's just come on oh, yeah. um Disney Plus. So we've got a date to watch that because we've seen it in the theatre and we're eager to see how it'll be different to watch it as a filmed production. But it's funny mm. because there's a lot of people who are struggling out of my theatre friends who are struggling to watch theatre on a screen as opposed mm -hmm. to, you know, sitting down in the theatre. How how do you feel like would you be in the same boat or do you think you you I actually been, enjoy it? I would have been in the same boat um, four or five months ago. Uh, I was always resistant to live streaming into cinemas. 
you know, the National mm-hmm. Theatre of London or the Met New York live streaming into cinemas. I was so resistant until I was uh, dragged along to a National Theatre production of a no card play featuring, oh, I can't remember now, uh, Andrew Scott. I, I, I wanted to see Andrew Scott. Oh, Andrew and, Scott. Because he, he won the Olivia Award for this this particular show. Yeah. And he was extraordinary. And what what those live, live streaming is, is I found interesting because they give you the sense of theatre. Like you go, as, you, as you're settling into your cinema seat with your popcorn and everything, um, you are listening to the settling in of an audience as well um, on the screen. And, yes. uh, it, and, you re, and, you, and you get added value. Like you get an interview with the director um, or you might get yes. an interview with the actors in the, in, in the, in the, you know, in the, in the interval, yeah. in the spaces yeah. uh, that they lay, mm-hmm. which you wouldn't get in theatre. And I think that live streaming needs to have added value. It needs to have something yes. else and give us greater yes. access to the people who are working, who actually create yeah. the show, not just directors, but I want, I love listening to actors talk about their work and uh, yes. as part of it. So I, I'd seen that and I thought, wow, I'm, I'm definitely going back for the next one. Um, definitely go back Absolutely. to the cinema for the next NT Live. <laughs> Unfortunately, there wasn't one because it was COVID. But now, of course, we're, we're kind of forced into this. And, uh, and I do think um, live performance where you see the labour of the labour of the actor, where you see the skill, the talent, and it's not yes. hidden by technology, etc. It's just literally bare in front of you. And then you see the actor in the dressing room coping with a 15 minute turnaround uh, and having to get probably re- a new costume and whatever. You see that if you get a <laughs> glimpse of backstage and which you wouldn't see in the theater, it's the added value. Go back behind the scenes and show that as well. Now, obviously there's Absolutely. lots of things you don't want to show going behind the scenes, but, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, there's certain things that you can Oh, definitely. There are certain <laughs> things that have to stay behind the curtain, aren't there, Brian? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, Brian, I have I have a, a question for you um, about our mm-hmm. our current situation. Uh, so how, how has our current situation broken traditional boundaries of the four walls of the theatre? And how will that influence theatre going forward, do you think? It's, well, its influence <laughs> is to close the theatres <laughs> completely. Yeah. Um, I think going forward, it, it I think, you know, theatre always mirrors the, the existence. It mirrors what, what we're doing. And I, I think um, I was reading um, online about the, an opera company in Madrid uh, they staged an opera where that only required a small orchestra so they could spread out the small orchestra in a large pit um, and keep the social distance. Um, and then the yeah. actors, of course, in opera, when you're singing, there's a lot of a lot coming out of the mouth uh, that could be potentially yes. dangerous. And so uh, the soloists were all spotlit and socially distanced and they, they, they created social distance into the dramaturgy of the um, of the presentation. Um, so, you know, singers were singing to each other, but not actually beside each other. And that, for me, that's actually really interesting because I teach and yeah. one of my courses is visual communication. And it, uh, I, I, you know, it's, what's more, what's more communicative, what's got greater communicative value is when the spectator completes the image. If you give yes, the, a okay. whole image. Um, we just take others, we recognize it. But if you don't complete it, if you take an element away from it, you're forcing us to complete it. You're making the audience more active. And I think social yeah. distancing, you see it around, you know, people have invented, you know, elbow. Yeah. This is a new sign. I never knew this yeah. meant something. Yeah. This is it's a new sign. Yeah. We've got all these new, it's the new, the new handshake, new isn't it? And, and there's the, there's the other gesture when uh, you go to hug and then you stop. It's like, it's almost like <laughs> pouncing. It's yeah. like, I'm, seeing, I'm yeah. seeing all these new gestures that are happening. And that might be a new vocabulary for us in the theatre. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, um, absolutely. Because uh, we've developed a new vocabulary. Um, and then the Zoom vocabulary, I, you know, if you, with all these um, teleconferencing um, applications now, there's a, there's a exactly. kind of performance is going on in, in terms of race hand, 
um, can't hear you. But, uh, <laughs> literally, we have to. We're, we're literally um, talking isn't enough anymore on this technology. That you have to yeah. use other things, either mechanical hands um, or or your own hands. Uh, so I think it, it it will influence how we receive theatre, and also in terms of how it's created. I, I think we're going to have to have a lot more work outside because the risk is less outside. Um, yes, the audience doesn't have to. The audience doesn't have to be outside. Um, the oh, that's be outside true. The audience inside. You know. Um, yeah. We, well, also, if we if we were outside, we we definitely have to bring our umbrellas. Uh, we we don't have the uh, <laughs> the joys of the, having Mediterranean weather. <laughs> no, no. Well, even that's that's fine as well. But or if you just reverse yeah. it, then um, the actors are yeah. there, but we're not allowed in. You know, there's all sorts of ways of playing playing with it. But we'll see what um, the rules are for theatre in terms of social distancing. I reckon it, yeah. it'll come down to one meter. Um, yes. But what what do you do? I mean, blocking off every third seat is that the way we want to go? Um, what if you go in a group of six? Can those six stay together? Um, I, yeah. I don't know. I think having a sparsely occupied auditorium is even more demoralizing for performers than having no one oh, there completely. at all. Completely, it's a lot. It's a uh, much harder work for them mm -hmm. um, to create that atmosphere. Uh, there's no, the well, no atmosphere audience just, members who are yeah uh, who uh, would be attending so um yeah so it's you, you've got to rethink that we've got to rethink what the audience how the audience are, is experiencing it um and what they're contributing to the performance um and yes. it may not just that they're in the theater or there's a mixture of both like I, i'm planning my teaching for um september and uh for so for seminars like we were with Two meter social distancing it's going to be hard getting the whole class into one room um yeah. and so i was thinking of alternating each week of um half at home half online uh half in the room uh and then some some lecturers are saying oh but you need someone to operate the computer for you and i said well no you don't you just simply um you don't distinguish between who's live and who's not live uh, if everyone's right. sitting with computer if everyone's sitting with their laptops or their phones it live in the yes. room and everyone at home is yeah. with their laptops and phones we're all we're all connected but we're, yeah. we're not actually in the same space um and yeah. it's it's think it's thinking around how do you get more people into the experience so think of it rather yes. as an experience more than as um this is an audience and this is what audiences do um yeah uh, you know it, having ex uh, I, I, I'm being fascinated with, um, I've done a lot of research in the last few years about the end of the 19th century in Paris and uh, and some of the things that were, were created uh, there for entertainment. This is the era of the waxworks, uh, people going in to see, not kings and queens and emperors and what have you, uh, but to, they would recreate scenes of murders. You know that would be in the newspapers and people uh, the, right. so they'd be visualized people going to see them the paris city Morgue was a huge attraction can you believe it <laughs> i Massive did not attraction. know that oh, it used to be behind behind the uh, people really do have morbid curiosity don't they they really well, do the, the, well yeah, it's interesting because it was behind notre dame i just i went there two years ago to find it and it's not there anymore it's just concrete it's a concrete park um but this okay. was the site of the city morgue it's in the middle of the river the island in the middle of the river of seine and um they had what they did every day was if there were bodies would turn up without identification because people were flooding into the city for work they didn't have ids the way what the way we would have and if they died they didn't know who they were um they didn't know who these people belong to and so they would uh it like shop window display have a curtain um like a, like brian thomas and uh, with curtains <laughs> and they would display the bodies and it was really for identification purposes so people would so people wow. would go and, if they'd lost relatives and see if they were they would the go windows. and but see it, okay. it became an entertainment, a form of entertainment a really bizarre macabre entertainment um and then if there were no bodies on a particular day you know there were riots because there was no experience yeah. for the people and yeah. uh, so it's all sorts of things that we think of as experiences and uh rather than as constructed performances 
Um, and uh, there was a, in, on the Seine as well, just not in the in the river. There was a, a wonderful contraption, a mechanical boat, where you you know the Seine is a river, and like it's not the sea, but uh, <laughs> you had a boat beside the, the river, and you could you would get you pay money, get get a ticket, get into the boat, then the boat would set off, wouldn't go anywhere, but it would rock and. and buck and kick and, and water, jets of water would come at it and you would get the experience of being on, on a boat in the sea. <laughs> that was another one. And I mean, there was all of these wonderful, wonderful experiences uh, were popular yeah. forms of entertainment and we've lost them all. Uh, we put them into yeah. fairgrounds for, and we, we've considered them for children as opposed for adults. You know, immersive, immersive theatre yeah. is, is possibly, you know, it's, it's here already, it's been here for quite a while. Um, yeah. to, for over the last 10 years. Um, but sometimes, like, a, you know, a lot of, I've written a book on Anu Productions work on the motorcycle, uh, yes. where yeah, a lot of that took place in the street, um, where half the time I didn't know, I know, I know the actors now, but at the time I didn't really know the actors and I didn't know whether it was an actor speaking to me or it was a member of the public. I didn't know how to react. Um, and then when I came out of the show, when, when, I, when, they, when the experience finished, uh, and I wasn't sure whether it had ended because I'm standing in the street thinking it's not over. And I, I've watched everything <laughs> as performance. Uh, yes. And uh, and also I, at the end of each show, because we were all individuals, um, mostly individuals or in pairs, we would get together at the end. And any, and I, cause I would see these shows multiple times and I always desire to find out what did you see? What did you experience? Yes, so because it was probably different for everyone and different every time it was performed as well. Absolutely. Um, and, and and they sought in different routes um, and um, experienced it differently. And then there were like performances just for one person that no one else saw. So there was this sharing of the wow. experience that happened. I stood for hours one day um, uh, on Foley Street, um, just, just chatting to complete strangers. Um, and uh, in fact, I walked with Laundry, which was set in the um, Sean McDermott Street uh, Laundry, the last one to be closed, uh, the Magdalene Laundry to be closed. I walked back with a man. Uh, there were three of us. There was a woman who was very upset by it, and she was in a in the caravan that they had. Um, you know, she went in for a cup of tea and yeah. a box of Kleenex, whereas she clearly yeah. had a I don't know a relationship with the material yeah. that that I didn't have and uh, or. I, I now know I do have, but I didn't actually know. And then okay. um, I walked walked into town with a spectator and I chatted all the way into town and I talked about laundry and over and over again, and I'm still talking about it nine years later. Yeah. Wow. Know, because it's, it really does it bring, has, bring audience members together. Um, think, and perhaps that's never, what we might miss if we, if we keep to the screen, if, if more theatre companies do um, take risks and and broaden their horizons and do promenade pieces like that and sp mm -hmm. site specific where we can social distance. That sounds like it could be um, a good you know alternative to being in a space. I think the you know the encounters how you you know and how you encounter it is one thing, but how the community feeling you know when you're sitting in a theatre of four hundred people and there is a ripple of laughter that goes through the audience and it's infectious. Yes. Uh, and uh, it's that community, even if you don't f laugh yourself, you feel it and you feel part yes. of something. And and you lose that when the spectator's on his or her own. And um, yes. but what I found is that it's, what it does is increase the desire to communicate with mm -hmm. total strangers. Whereas yes. when you go to a theater yeah. of 400 people, if you're on your own, you just go home. Or you might, if you're with someone, you might go for a drink, but you stay within your unit, usually. Yes. And, yes. Uh, but with this, uh, this type of performance, you actually want to come together. It increases the desire to come back and yeah. actually have a chat about it. So I think if it's online, we need the chat facility. Um, yes. You know, we need to be able to communicate and, or not just yeah. chat on the screen, but, but have multiple devices and, uh, you know, we're all, we're all sitting at home watching TV with scrolling our phones and we're doing multi, you know, and the doorbell rings and then, you know, the micro microwave pings. There's all these things going on at once. And we've got, <laughs> uh, you know, 
I used to hate it because of like that. I was one one image, one moment. Whereas now we live in a kind of multi-image world where we can read text at the bottom of the screen and we can watch three different people do three different things and scroll our Absolutely. phones and have a conversation with our family beside us. It's all and about it's so, all about multitasking now, isn't it? And multitasking. Able to do that. Yeah, yeah and, completely. Uh, um, uh, Brian, so I, 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 I have one last, mm. I have one last question for you, um, yeah. and it's actually, it's, it's, uh, I have to say, I confess, it's, it's shying a little bit away from theatre, but it's yeah. a, a guilty pleasure that I think we share. Um, mm -hmm. I hear that you are a fan of the Eurovision Song Contest, and that you have been going to it <laughs> for many years, and talk about design and it being an absolute field day for any designer. When did your love of the Eurovision start? When I was eight. I was eight years old. When you were eight. Uh, uh, and I saw Sandy Shaw for Britain. Was it 68, 67? Sang Puppet on a String. And, uh, but it, it, so I watched, I wasn't allowed to stay up for it, you know. So I, you know, I'd see the clips during the day uh, or on the news uh, the following day. And, um, but it, it was when I was allowed to stay up for the first time with, after Dana won. She won in 1970 and I came to Dublin, yeah. the Gaiety Theatre Dublin, and I was allowed to stay up. And there was a woman performing, uh, the winner was uh, from Monaco and singing in French. Um, oh, uh, uh, bon I can sing it if you like, but I won't. Uh, and oh, uh, do. This, give us, give I, it's just gone to, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just gone to secondary. I just switched to secondary school, and um, I was learning French from a native speaker. It was an experiment in, in the north at that time. They were putting native speakers into classes, and so we never spoke a word of English in uh, a French class. And, uh, and then suddenly, I saw on TV for the very first time um, someone singing in French, and I knew the words, and I thought, "Wow." This is amazing. It's a spectacle and it's glamorous and it's wonderful. And I love this. And I fell in love with it. And then I started, I actually was pushed into uh, writing about it. So I've, this, one of those many essays wow. and things that I've written is a, 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 several of them. My most, my most downloaded essay of all the things I've written isn't, is about the Eurovision Song Contest. <laughs> Oh my gosh! Yeah. Well, it just shows I mean, I, you how how much of a wide reach the Eurovision has all around it the does. world, you know. Uh, but it's also, you know, you know, with Terry Wogan's commentary, it it got into a bad place because he was so negative about you know uh, the vote, so called voting blocks in the East. I um, as I was starting the scholarship in the in around two thousand four five, um, I started going to the shows. So the first one I saw was was the was it the 50th anniversary concert in um, in Copenhagen, which were all the stars from the past were there. And of course, I was in the second row, it was heaven. They were sitting wow. beside me, it was absolutely. But the, you were the in the second year went, row? Yeah. And, uh, oh my um, goodness, <laughs> great seat. That's the, the power of being a fan and knowing people. And then, uh, <laughs> and then I went to see the contest in Athens and, and Serbia and Belgrade. Uh, and I went to, you know, if I got uh, accreditation, so I was able to go behind the scenes and saw it being put together and uh, was in all the rehearsals for it as well. So I got a sense of the the, the construction around it um, and yeah. how it's not just a song. It's uh, it's much more than that. Um, it's, yeah. uh, it's, a, it's several months of communication to an international audience. Um, yes. And uh, yeah, and uh, the, probably the most exciting one of all was in Moscow because they had virtually two thirds of the world's LED um, on the stage, and, uh, wow. and that was a spectacle <laughs> in itself. So wow, yeah. Yes. So I mean, I love, I love, I'm very. I nearly ended up um, going to design school. Um, I, I, I was useless at art at school. Um, I gave it up uh, after three years and. Uh, but when I was studying theatre, I took a module in design and absolutely loved it. And uh, so my, the design teacher was trying to send me on to post-grad in the Wimbledon School of Art because they did a particular theatre design course at that time. Um, so I could have gone down a different track, but I'm a very visual wow. person. Yeah. Yes. So it would seem that you're attracted to all the different kinds of visuals all of, that the world has to offer. 
We've just had an absolutely fabulous chat. I feel like we could we could go on for forever. We've we've gone from cry, uh, babies on stage, the Eurovision. Yes. <laughs> we've talked. <laughs> Which didn't happen. The Eurovision didn't no, happen. She, no, I know that was so sad. Mm. We talked about world theatre and the future of the Irish stage. Um, but thank you. That was amazing. Uh, it was just an absolute honour and a privilege to to chat to you today. And thank you so much for for joining us here on on Stage Door Live. Well, thank you, Kelly. Sorry, it was you... A, yeah, I mean, this is the first time I've actually had a proper talk about theatre <laughs> with anyone. <laughs> so for quite some time, and it's an absolute pleasure to meet you, Kelly. Um, it was absolutely much. wonderful to chat to you. Thank you so much.